Thank you so much, Bjorn, for this uh, kind and nice introduction. It's an honor and a privilege giving this presentation about how to use algorithms and artificial intelligence in epilepsy and in electroencephalography in EEG. And this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, so why algorithms and how to develop them? I'm going to talk about biomarker-derived algorithms, AI models, and decision support systems. And we look at applications uh, for diagnosis and classification of epilepsy and in wearable <laughs> devices. But let's start with some basic facts about epilepsy for the sake of uh, mathematicians. So epilepsy is one of the most common neurologic conditions. Um, one in 10 of us will, during our lifetime, experience at least one seizure. And then the prevalence of uh, epilepsy in the general population, 0.6%. So that means that uh, on worldwide, we have more than 50 million people with epilepsy. And then EEG electroencephalography is one of the most important diagnostic methods to confirm the diagnosis of epilepsy and to classify it for an optimal choice of anti-seizure medication. However, interpretation of EEG is time consuming and it requires expertise not available everywhere. So why do we need algorithms in epileptology and in EEG? Well, we need them to provide expertise where experts are not available because the treatment gap in epilepsy is huge is between 60 to even 100% in the low and middle income countries. And it's mainly the expertise that's lacking. And of course we could use these algorithms to help experts where they are available to reduce their workload and also to um, oops. yes also uh, because the experts uh, can disagree so it would be useful to reduce the inter-expert variability and god forbid we may come with some algorithms which are even better than the experts <laughs> so how sh shall we develop these algorithms well, of course, uh, AI models are the trendy thing, but I was really, really happy when I, I read this recently published uh, review in, in Nature Medicine that the authors emphasize that we should not completely forget the classical approaches, the algorithms targeting biomarkers and also algorithms or nomograms uh, based on published evidence and systematizing the expert opinion. So let's start with the first application that I would like to present you today. And this is about the automated seizure detection using wearable devices. And the International League Against Epilepsy in collaboration with the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology has recently published a clinical practice guideline about how to use these gadgets. And the objectives of using these wearable devices for automated seizure detection is safety to decrease the injuries and also the deaths that can occur after the seizures. And we also need an objective seizure quantification because the patients and the caregivers cannot really provide this. Patients cannot remember more than half of their seizures. So let's start with uh, an algorithm that was targeting a biomarker and we used surface electromyography. So muscle signals during the convulsive seizures, uh, seizures with jerks. And here you can see that uh, we, we place electrodes on the muscle. And then here in green color, you can see the, this beautiful signal from a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Now, again, this is the EMG signal during a uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizure. This is the root mean square, so a way to uh, normalize the, the amplitude. And then this is the median frequency. So what you can see that uh, when there is a notch and increase in the amplitude, you have a huge increase in frequency. So we call this um, biomarker, an electrophysiological biomarker of the seizure. So we constructed an algorithm specifically targeting this. So we have a threshold for the amplitude uh, to target this one. And then we go for the high frequencies. Now, a very uh, cheap and efficient way to, to monitor the frequency real time on a wearable device is to count how often the signal crosses the baseline. So this uh, uh, zero cross 
count is here. So then we, we just need a threshold both for the number of the zero counts and also for the duration where this must be beyond the threshold. And we trained this uh, in a data set and then we conducted uh, so-called phase three validation device, uh, 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 phase three validation study on this wearable device. So here you can see this is the mini EMG. This is a plaster which contains the EMG electrodes. And then this is the signal from this device. And then a phase three is a multi-center perspective blinded with real-time analysis, a multi-center study where you have a clear gold standard from uh, epilepsy monitoring units. Now the sensitivity of this uh, gadget to catch the uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizure was 94% with a good median detection latency of nine seconds uh, and uh, relatively low force alarm rate, especially during the night. Now we can also use this um, gadget to distinguish between convulsive epileptic seizures and distractors like psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. So uh, using this uh, algorithm, we can distinguish between the two entities with an accuracy of 95%. And this is important because roughly 10% of the patients treated for convulsive status epilepticus in the emergency room actually do not have seizures. So it's very important to provide this expertise also during the night when unexpected experienced young residents decide about the treatment. Then we can use this algorithm uh, for an objective characterization of the seizure type. So we can objectively measure the duration of the seizure, the duration of different components during the seizure. And then when we put these together, we could predict the post-ictal generalized EEG suppression. So following these big generalized convulsive seizures, the EEG is flat. And that's a problem because that can lead to SUDEP, and that's the sudden unexpected death in, in epilepsy. In a very simplified way, there is a huge inhibition stopping the seizure, but because the inhibition is uh, too pronounced, it goes also uh, for the brainstem, stopping the patient from breathing. So it would be an advantage to know in advance which are these dangerous uh, seizures. So we train uh, an AI model and we could predict these dangerous seizures with a prolonged post generalized EEG suppression with an accuracy of 85%. Now let's move to another seizure type. So these were the convulsive seizures with lots of jerks, but we have also seizures without uh, much motor activity. So uh, we um, intended to use heart rate signals. Now heart is not brain, epilepsy comes from the brain, that's true, but more than 80% of the seizures have associated uh, changes in the heart rhythm. Now you can simply calculate the heart rhythm, but then you get a false alarm every time the patient goes upstairs and we don't want that. So we, we looked at, uh, a little bit closer at the signals and we looked at the cardiac sympathetic index. Well, you calculate this by plotting uh, one RR peak. So one uh, period between two heartbeats against the next one. So you get plots like this. And then the cardiac sympathetic index is uh, the four times the standard deviation in this L direction divided by four times in the transversal direction. So we asked the patients uh, with epilepsy to use an exercise bike, and then we looked at uh, the same during a seizure. And we can see that the elongation in this L axis is much, much bigger during a seizure compared to exercise. So this way we can differentiate between a physiological tachycardia, a physiological increase in the heart rate, uh, and the epileptic changes in the heart rate. So we took this of this L because that's what uh, is specific for the seizure. So here you can see this modified cardiac sympathetic index. Uh, this red bar marks the seizure and you can see that this increase is really much at the start of the seizure. And this is an exercise so the modified cardiac sympathetic index doesn't even come close to this. And then uh, we have validated this in phase two studies. Now, the bad news is that, of course, this does not work on all patients and all seizures. It only works on those patients who have a marked change in the heart rate, marked autonomic or vegetative nervous system changes during a seizure. Uh, roughly, this is, however, more than half of the population. And that within these patients who, who are responders, that that is, they have seizures with autonomic changes. The sensitivity is really good. It's 81% for the non-convulsive seizures, so without um, jerks. And then for the big generalized tonic-clonic seizures, this is 90% with a false alarm rate of one per day. 
And here you can see this mini EKG device that is uh, using the algorithm. So nowadays we are playing with this uh, implantable device. So this is a mini EKG, which is implanted under the skin. And this is a routine procedure for the cardiologist. So basically we, we combine the well-known uh, hardware technology from uh, the cardiology with our algorithm. And so far the, the um, results are really promising. So out of the 22 focal seizures uh, in these patients, we uh, managed to detect 21. So this is another seizure type. These are absence seizures. And here you can see a wearable EEG device. So there are dry electrodes here. And then uh, here we, we used a different approach. We trained an AI model to catch these absence seizures. And again, we validated it in a phase three study. So perspective, multicenter, 102 patients, altogether 39 of them had seizures, altogether more than 300 absence seizures. And the sensitivity of this gadget with the algorithm was around 80% for all the seizures and the median per patient, the median sensitivity per patient was 92%. Now the force alarm rate was 0 0.6 per hour. So nowadays, the, the, the clinicians diagnose epilepsy based on, on, what, on the history. So what the patient and the caregiver, the family member or friends witnessing the seizure tell them. But this information about the seizure from the patients and, and the family and the witnesses are inaccurate. So back in, in uh, 2012, we showed that the accuracy of epilepsy diagnosis and classification increased from 50% to 84% if we show the experts videos, not just the description from the witnesses. And then later on, this uh, large perspective trial showed the um, added value from using the videos from uh, smartphones. Now, there is a challenge with using smartphone um, seizure videos. Well, um, obviously, um, the caregivers and the witnesses do not film the patient all the time. So when the seizure starts, then they have to switch on the, the camera. And then we always miss the beginning of the seizure, which can be problematic. We miss lots of good information. And sometimes the last part of the seizure can, can be confusing. Okay, then you could say, yeah, we can have the video all the time on the patient, for example, when the patient is at home, but that generates a hell lot of data. So you, you, need, to, you need to decrease the data. And then we, we again trained an AI model. Um, well, our, honestly, our goal was, was to catch the seizures, but it's, it's, it's not um, good enough to catch the seizures, but it can eliminate those uh, epochs where there's certainly no seizure. So we, we managed to, to achieve a data reduction by uh, 86%. So basically the physician then uh, uh, evaluating the videos does not need to go through the whole video, but just these spots marked by the algorithm. And then let's go on with the uh, diagnosis of epilepsy. So uh, these so-called spikes, the interictal epileptic form discharges are the best biomarkers for diagnosing epilepsy. Now we trained um, uh, and validated an AI model to find these spikes. And um, there are some challenges with, with this approach and it's not only our group who face these challenges, but then we came with a possible solution. So the, the algorithm has a high sensitivity, but too low specificity. And this is the general challenge, not for us, but for other groups too. So we could then set up hybrid systems where the algorithm first scans the whole EEG recording, and this makes sure you have a high sensitivity. Then the algorithm clusters them, groups them. So all those spikes which resemble each other are, group, are put into one group. So if there are 20,000, you don't need to look at 20,000 examples. You just look at a couple of examples from that cluster. And this saves time. And then the human experts can look at these clusters and then the human experts can give the specificity. So this hybrid or semi-automated method is what we are trying to promote now. And we tested this, uh, we, we did a head-to-head -head comparison of our algorithms and, and two other algorithms or AI models more precisely. So this is deep, sp uh, deep spike. And here you can see that there are many, many spikes, but grouped into clusters. And then this is SpikeNet. This is from uh, a group from Boston. Uh, and then this is another Amer uh, group from the US Persist. So these are clusters of, uh, of spikes. 
Now, what's the specificity? Well, in blue, you can see the specificity if you do a fully automated spike detection, and it's too low. I mean, you cannot put into clinical practice, not even with a specificity of 63%. I mean, that, that means that, that uh, you would unnecessarily treat uh, uh, almost half of the patients. So this is a no-go. Yet, if you show the clusters to the experts, then the specificity increases significantly and increases over 95%, which is also what experts can achieve. Now, the sensitivity was, was high uh, when, when you do fully automated, and it does not drop significantly when, uh, uh, when you have the experts to control to check these detected clusters but you reduce the time consumption. And this is, this is important because experts are more and more busy. Uh, you know that our population is older and older. The pressure is, is higher and higher on, on healthcare. So it's very important to come with uh, new technology, which uh, decreases the time burden. So this hybrid approach can achieve that. And then we trained a fully automated um, uh, EG reading uh, AI model. Uh, and um, we trained this, we developed this on uh, 30,000 EGs, which were highly annotated using the SCORE system. And SCORE stands for Standardized Computer-Based Organized Reporting of EG. Now, um, a classical EG report is, um, is a free text report, so it's almost like a I used to tease my colleagues that it's almost like a Rorschach test. So you just look at the EG and then they associate with something and then they describe in free text. Now the score uh, is different. You have to, to put some labels into the EG and then from a predefined list, you have to click and say which EG, clinically relevant EG feature you spot. So I think that in itself increases the quality of EG reporting, but then this builds uh, an ideal database for, for training algorithms. And that, that's what we, we did. And then we uh, validated it on 10,000 uh, independent uh, EEGs. Now, what's the output of this algorithm? Well, first of all, it uh, separates normal from abnormal, and then it classifies into four major categories, the abnormal. So we have the epileptiform is focal, epileptiform is generalized discharges, slowing diffuse and slowing focal. Now these are very, very important because uh, actually these are the major categories which later on guide you on the next diagnostic steps and also the uh, choice of treatment. Now we submit this to a journal which is very, very picky, so I'm not allowed to tell you the, the results, but it's really impressive. <laughs> so um, let's go on with the uh, decision support systems. Um, so we, we tried to develop this system to help especially the low and uh, middle income countries where um, there is a, a lack of, of experts. But then we, we programmed the algorithm based on the published uh, evidence, published literature, uh, and also uh, we did a DELPHI process with uh, experts. So first we have an algorithm which classifies the seizures for the purpose of selecting the uh, ideal uh, anti-seizure medication. And then in the next step is the selection of the medication itself. Now, first we had to reduce the, because um, the International League Against Epilepsy comes with a huge um, uh, list of seizures. There are 63 seizures, but um, do they have, uh, do they make any difference? So we, we tried to, to reduce this to the level where each class of seizure as a therapeutic consequence. And then we, we ended up based on, on the Delphi consensus and the published literature with this much shorter uh, list of seizures. And then we elaborated very, very simple questions. So act actually um, secretaries in, in the waiting room of, uh, of the physicians can, can easily fill this in, having a reasonable discussion with the patients. So we have some so-called red flag questions. These attract your attention that perhaps the patient does not have actually epilepsy. This could be another paroxysmal uh, episode. And then we have a set of questions which classify the epilepsy. One question is about the MRI, but we, we also evaluated how good it works where MRI is not available. 
And the algorithm is very, very simple. So if you go through these questions, then you can classify the, the different types of epileptic seizures. It's very, very simple, but you know, as I, I grow older, I realize that simple things are the, the most reliable. Now, um, for, uh, this is the second part of the algorithm where we um, actually uh, suggest which is the best anti-seizure medication for that particular patient. So this is tailored for the individual patients. So first we, we have a long list based on published evidence, which seizure type needs what kind of seizure, we call this nesting. And then uh, the next step is where we look at modifiers. When, when we tailor the medication to the patient, uh, specifically as age, other comedication, comorbidities, uh, any adverse effect profile, uh, drug interaction profile. And you see, there is a long, long list for what you should not prescribe for whom and what you should prescribe from whom. It's a long, long list. Um, experts are supposed to know this. I'm not sure all experts know this. Uh, at least I, I have difficulties uh, remembering all these uh, evidences. Uh, we, can, we, we also constructed a kind of memo which uh, the uh, Young Epilepsy section of the International League Against Epilepsy published to help the youngsters, but then we put it into, into this uh, algorithm. So again, first we get the seizure type also from the algorithm, then we do the nesting, and then depending on these modifiers, we move them up or down. So group one is the optimal choice, uh, second and third optimal, and then some are not recommended. So uh, this is freely um, um, available, accessible on the internet. This is the Epipic application. So you type in, it doesn't take more than two minutes to, to fill it in. So you just type in the basic data, the age of the patient, uh, the, the sex, and then you have the questions addressing the seizure classification. And then you have these red flag questions that just to make sure perhaps you have to rethink that the patient has at all epilepsy. And then you go to the modifiers, and then the algorithm suggests you what's the best option for the patient, second best option, third best option, and then you can you can get an explanation why the algorithm considers this the best option for the particular patient, and then you, you get also specific instructions both for the physician and for the and for the patient and, and the relatives. So you could ask, okay, does this work? So we, we had um, many validation studies supporting uh, that it, it actually works. The classification part um, was validated in one large prospective study, the theoretic part in three retrospective studies. And we also had a feasibility study in third world countries. So this is the validation study of the uh, classification part, 262 consecutive patients, and we had gold standard from epilepsy centers. So we compared the output of the algorithm with the output of, of uh, trained experts from epilepsy centers. Now in the whole cohort, large cohort, there was an almost perfect agreement between the classification of the algorithm and that one of the experts. And then we, we said, okay, but perhaps MRI is not available in, in all places. So what if we remove that question? Still a substantial agreement. And of course, it's better when the patient has epilepsy, when the patient has a non-epileptic paroxysmal episode, then it's, it's lower, but still it's a high margin a beyond chance agreement. And then we uh, tested the um, ability of the algorithm to recommend the uh, best anti-seizure medication for a, a particular patient. So uh, we used 25 representative patient cases and we showed that to 24 international experts, I mean heavyweight experts, uh, really key opinion leaders in the field. And then we compared the choices of the experts with the choices of the algorithm. Now, first of all, it, it was uh, funny to see that the experts did not, surprise, surprise, did not really ag agree. So the uh, inter-expert agreement was only fair. And then the algorithm was closer to the consensus majority expert uh, choices than the individual experts. And then we showed the, all of the algorithm choices to the experts and then they strongly agreed with what the algorithm picked. And then we also validated this retrospectively in a primary care center. And um, we took advantage of the fact that in, in these centers, uh, untrained residents also prescribe anti-epileptic drugs. So we, we hope that some of, of their choices are suboptimal. And then we compared um, the outcome of, um, of the patients if uh, the physicians gave something that the algorithm would have recommended 
compared to what the algorithm would not have recommended. And here you can see that the retention rate is significantly higher if the patient got a uh, drug which was recommended by the algorithm as compared uh, with drugs not recommended by the algorithm. The seizure freedom was much higher if a drug recommended by the algorithm was pre prescribed as compared with those not favored by the algorithm. And the uh, severe uh, side effects leading to discontinuation of the treatment was much lower if uh, the patient got an, uh, a drug prescribed, uh, recommended by the algorithm as compared with those not favored by the algorithm. And then we also conducted a feasibility study in third world countries from Brazil to India, and it, uh, it was feasible also in these underserved areas. And then recently, um, a group of uh, uh, colleagues from Sweden also went through their large registry data set. They ran um, the EpiPIC algorithm, and they confirmed that uh, the choices of the algorithm have a higher retention rate in their Swedish big data set. So to sum this up, um, I showed you that uh, algorithms uh, can accurately uh, detect seizures when implemented into wearable devices. So I showed you biomarker derived algorithms in surface electromyography and surface electrocardiography devices. Also AI models uh, implemented into wearable EG devices. And then I showed you algorithms for epilepsy diagnostics both hybrid or semi-automated systems using artificial intelligence models for uh, detecting spikes in EEG and also for seizure classification based on video recordings. And I showed you also fully automated EEG classification using an AI model. I showed you also that um, the seizure support system comes uh, with uh, reliable and good choices for seizure classification and patient tailored choice of optimal drug therapy. And with this aerial view of uh, Aarhus University Hospital and my other affiliation, the Danish Epilepsy Center, I would like to thank you for your attention.